Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and this is Cults. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one of the most infamous cults in Canadian history, the Ant Hill Kids. I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Richardson. Thank you, Greg. In part one of our two-part series on the Ant Hill Kids, we focused on the cult's notorious leader, Roque Theriot. We uncovered how a Catholic boy from a small Canadian mining town grew up to be a monstrous cult leader. In part two, we'll learn more about the Ant Hill Kids themselves. Why did these young men and women follow Roque into the wilderness? What did they believe? And as Roque conducted an ever-escalating campaign of torture, mutilation, and murder against his followers, why didn't they try to save themselves or their children? Americans like to make a lot of jokes about Canada, but there's a lot we don't know about our friendly neighbor to the north. For example, many Americans believe in the stereotype of the nice, friendly Canadian. One reason the stereotype about nice Canadians persists among Americans is many mistakenly believe Canada is one monolithic culture. In fact, Canada has a rich history of diversity and prides itself on its cultural mosaic. Unlike in the United States, where the phrase cultural melting pot references Americans' preference for assimilation, Canada's cultural mosaic embraces the coexistence of different immigrant groups. The former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, even gave an address celebrating the country's multiculturalism in the face of terrorism. The fact of the matter is this is a country that welcomes all cultures and all faiths, and the terrorists and the people they represent stand for nothing but hatred, and people of goodwill of all cultures and all faiths in this country will oppose those kinds of acts. One such distinctive immigrant group is the French Canadians. The French were some of the earliest European colonists in North America. Roque Theriot's ancestors, Jean and Perrine Theriot, were among the first French immigrants to Canada in the 1640s. But the French didn't control Canada for long. In the 1700s, the French fought a seven-year war with the British for control of Canada. After losing the Seven Years' War in 1763, the French handed over Quebec to the British. Fortunately for the Québécois, Britain's Parliament passed the Quebec Act of 1774, allowing the Québécois to maintain their Catholic religion, their French legal system, and their language. Not too bad of a deal. Even so, tensions have remained fraught between the French-speaking Québécois and the English-speaking Canadian majority for centuries, so much so that Quebec held a referendum for independence from Canada as recently as 1995, which was defeated by just one percentage point. In this clip provided by CTV, Stephen Harper, the same Prime Minister who applauded Canada's cultural mosaic, also insisted that Quebec would never be given full independence. Do the Quebecois form a nation within Canada? The answer is yes. Do the Quebecois form an independent nation? The answer is no. And the answer will always be no. The two cultures remain so distinct that many French Canadians don't speak English, and many English Canadians don't speak French. Roque Theriot, who unlike his followers spoke French and English, was able to take advantage of these cultural and linguistic chasms to isolate his followers, bamboozle some of the most prominent psychologists in Canada, and create one of the most notorious cults in Canadian history. Drawing inspiration from the apocalyptic beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which he was briefly a member, Roque created a doomsday cult whose followers believed he was a prophet named Moses in direct communication with the Master, or God. Roque promised the world would end soon, yet his followers stayed even after his predictions were proven wrong. For over 10 years, Roque kept an iron grip on a core group of around a dozen followers, utilizing both their love and fear of him to keep them in line. No matter what mutilation or torture they had to endure, they would not leave their prophet's side. Roque used the women as his personal harem, fathering 30 children in total, but even the cult's children were not safe from their monstrous father. As a child, Roque Terrio was a clever, well-read boy who seemed destined for a bright future. His teachers were saddened to see him drop out of school after eighth grade, but he still managed to do well for himself. 
He got a job in Montreal and moved there with his new wife, Francine. But Roque had struggled with stomach pain since his teens, and in 1971, Roque's physical and mental health took a turn for the worse after his ulcer surgery. Vanessa's going to handle the psychology here. It's important to note that Vanessa's not a licensed or trained psychologist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. Roke's personality changed drastically after his ulcer surgery. He became an alcoholic to deal with his chronic stomach pain. He showed signs of being a hypochondriac, telling everyone he had cancer and was going to die from his non-fatal condition. He became obsessed with religion and the occult, and he also became increasingly self-absorbed and fixated on sex. In the early 1970s, Roke began cheating on his wife Francine, with whom he had two young sons, Roke Jr. and Francois. On February 13, 1976, he began dating a 24-year-old woman named Giselle. Giselle was born in Charlevoix County on March 16, 1951, the fifth of seven children. Giselle idolized her father but hated her mother for neglecting the family and cheating on her father. Giselle wanted to eventually grow up and be a loyal partner. It's not uncommon for the child of an abusive parent to try to be the polar opposite of that parent. Unfortunately, Giselle's childhood desire to stay loyal to her future husband would make it that much easier for her future partner, the cult leader Roque Theriot, to keep her in the cult. By the fall of 1976, Giselle had rented an apartment in Thetford Mines so that her new boyfriend Roque could stay with her on the weekends. In the early months of 1977, Roque converted to Catholicism from Seventh-day Adventism. As a Seventh-day Adventist, Roque quit drinking and adopted both a healthy vegetarian lifestyle and the belief that Judgment Day, the Second Coming, were imminent. By May of 1977, he had convinced Giselle to convert as well. Clearly, Roque was very persuasive if he could convince his girlfriend to convert to a new religion so quickly. That's true. Roque was a born salesman. After Roque's pastor, Pierre Zita, got Roque a job selling Seventh-day Adventist pamphlets, he impressed both Giselle and Pastor Zita by convincing people to sign up for Seventh-day Adventist anti-smoking clinics and buy Seventh-day Adventist pamphlets simultaneously. But it wouldn't be long before Roque began taking advantage of his position in the Seventh-day Adventist church for his own nefarious ends. It all began in the summer of 1977. Pastor Zita decided to try and convert more French Catholics to Seventh-day Adventism, and he zeroed in on a town by the name of Plesseville. Quite a few young people began attending Pastor Zita's meetings. Among them were a young man named Jacques Vizet, and his friends 19-year-old Chantal, 18-year-old Francine, and 21-year-old Solange. Solange was a bright and rebellious young woman with an unhappy home life. She loathed her father, an alcoholic who abused everyone in Solange's family. Abuse leaves children susceptible to what's known as the intergenerational cycle of violence. Basically, when a parent psychologically or physically abuses either their spouse or their children, the child exposed to the abuse is more likely to grow up to be abusive or a victim of abuse. So having an abusive father makes someone more likely to date or marry an abusive man. Unfortunately, according to this theory, that's possible. It can continue for generations. Unlike Solange, 19-year-old Chantel had a happy home life. She was a quiet daydreamer with loving and protective parents. However, she was prone to moodiness and possible depression. Chantal's friend, 18-year-old Francine, was outgoing but secretly insecure about her appearance. We've seen before how male cult leaders often take advantage of young women's insecurities to make them feel loved, beautiful, and special. Roque had an intense charisma, which he used to full advantage to charm both women and men. It wasn't long before he had all four young people entranced by his long, rambling speeches about the upcoming end of the world. Roque may have been a bit pompous and long-winded, but he wasn't yet openly straying from the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. Pastor Zita assumed that Roque was genuinely helping lead Jacques, Solange, Chantal, and Francine to the Seventh-day Adventist church. But Roque didn't want Pastor Zita to be their spiritual advisor. He wanted to hold on to his control over the four young people. He began inviting them to camp out at Giselle's apartment on weekends so they could listen to him preach. One of the most important things a cult leader does to control his followers is isolate them from everyone who isn't in the cult. 
Keeping everyone at Giselle's apartment was just the first of many moves Roque made to cut his followers off from others and reinforce the group dynamic. It wasn't long before Roque collected more followers. Nicole, a young woman haunted by the death of her mother, met Roque and almost immediately moved into Giselle's apartment to live with Roque and Giselle. 24-year-old Claude, a young man planning to attend optician school, also joined Roque's Bible lessons. Then, two of Francine's friends from high school began attending group sessions, 18-year-old Maurice and 20-year-old Jose. Cult leaders often recruit people in a transitional period. Roque could tell that his young followers were looking for a sense of purpose in their lives. He played into this need for purpose, promising them that the way to give their lives meaning was by listening to him. In the late summer of 1977, Roque recruited two new pretty young women while at a seminar retreat for Seventh-day Adventists. Roque was relaxing at a resort near Lake Rousseau when he noticed two French-Canadian members of the resort staff, Gabrielle and Yolanda. Gabrielle's nursing training made Roque eager to recruit her into the cult. Not surprising, given Roque's obsession with his own health and medical knowledge. Gabrielle believed that, unlike many of the terrible men that she dated in the past, Roque seemed like a trustworthy person. Roque convinced Gabrielle and Yolanda to come live with him in Quebec. But Gabrielle didn't fit in with the others. Unlike the other girls who hadn't finished college, she was already in her mid-twenties and well-educated. She was proud of her education and always trying to impress Roque with her medical knowledge. But while Roque may have initially recruited Gabrielle for her medical knowledge, he would punish her for it in the end. In fact, Roque's eventual torture and mutilation of Gabrielle was so horrific, it would be the key to his undoing. Now a quick break for something lighter. In lighter news, I went to a wedding out of town last weekend. Ooh, fun. It was very fun and so stress-free because they had everything set up on Zola. From suggested accommodations, the schedule for the weekend, information about the ceremony, the registry, and even silly little pictures of the bride and groom, to, you know, to remind us what it's all about. It was so convenient as a guest. Zola's registry includes items across over 500 brands and companies. So you can contribute to the honeymoon fund, or you could buy traditional home items, or even help fund experiences like front row concert tickets or a year of HelloFresh. Wow, I wish I'd had Zola for my wedding. Plus, the friendly customer service team will go above and beyond. And with Zola's top-rated app for iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch, couples can manage their registries on the go. Over 300,000 couples have. To sign up with Zola and receive a $50 credit towards your registry, go to Zola.com slash cults. That's Zola, Z-O-L-A dot com slash cults to sign up for a $50 credit towards your registry. One thing I'd recommend asking for, a Casper mattress. My husband and I have one, and he insists it's the best mattress he's ever slept on. I just got one recently, and I was amazed at how such a comfortable mattress could fit in such a tiny box. I don't know how they did that, but my back is sure glad it came right to my home. And now Casper has three models, the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential. Each mattress is perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry. Not to mention the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. But the best part is that you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. They even offer free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. Start sleeping ahead of the curve with Casper. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash cults and using cults at checkout. That's casper.com slash cults. Offer code CULTS for $50 off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions apply. Now let's get back to the story. As the summer of 1977 turned to fall, many of Roque Terrio's young followers were supposed to go back to college, but he convinced them all to drop out. Roque needed to keep his followers isolated and by his side in order to control them. Roque got his young followers to help with his Seventh-day Adventist non-smoking programs by preparing vegetarian meals. Roque began making several thousand dollars a week with the help of his followers by asking the program attendees for donations, which he pocketed for himself. 
Roke was clearly developing what's known as a destructive cult. Destructive cults are centered around a charismatic leader who uses his followers for personal gain. Destructive cult leaders often commit acts of violence against their own followers. Roke may not have been harming his followers quite yet, but he was obviously using them to get rich. In September of 1977, Roque recruited two new followers, a 24-year-old construction worker named Jacques Giguere and his wife, 23-year-old cake factory worker, Maurice Grenier. They brought their infant daughter with them. Jacques was seduced by Roque's speeches about living a simpler life, but Maurice only joined Roque's followers because Jacques wanted to. She kept apart from the others in the group and, unlike the other women, wasn't infatuated with Roque. She was there because she loved her husband. Maurice's love for her husband would separate her from others in the group and help her maintain a sense of identity. But unfortunately, her love for her husband and unwillingness to leave him would also keep her tied to the group for years. As Roke's flock grew, the parents of Roke's followers were terrified to discover that their children had been ensnared by a dangerous con man. Chantel's parents in particular suspected that Chantel, who was spending all her free time at Roque's apartment, needed psychological help to free herself from Roque's influence. They rushed her to see a psychologist. Chantel agreed to a one-month stay at a psychiatric hospital. Roque realized he hadn't isolated his followers enough. He needed to remove them from outside influences who wanted to help them, like their parents and therapists. That explains why in October of 1977, Roke rented a two-story building in St. Marie, about an hour's drive from Thetford Mines. Roke easily talked Chantel into leaving the hospital and drove the group in a truck all the way down to the new town. Despite the best efforts of Chantel's parents to get her psychological help, they couldn't free her from Roke's control. In the fall of 1977, Roke and his followers opened the Healthy Living Clinic in St. Marie. Roque soon recruited more followers. Francine's friends, José and Maurice, quit school to permanently join the group and work at Roque's clinic. Roque began to increase his control over his followers. To break down their sense of individuality, he made them all wear long robes and told them to give up all their possessions. While many in the group loved the family atmosphere, Giselle was growing worried. Many of Roque's female followers seemed to be in love with him. She was still Roke's girlfriend, and the only one he was actually sleeping with. Roke agreed to marry Giselle on January 8, 1978, but it quickly became clear that Roke didn't want to take the marriage seriously. There was no honeymoon, and group activities resumed as normal. Giselle soon became pregnant with their first child and was frustrated that Roke didn't seem interested in her. She threatened to leave. Roke punched her in the face. Roke had already shown a desire to control the women in his life with his constant speeches about how the Bible said women should submit to men. But as this early episode shows, Roke was clearly willing to use both psychological and physical abuse to control the women in his cult. The people of St. Marie were beginning to grow suspicious of Roke. He wasn't paying his bills, and Roke's behavior was growing more disturbing. In March of 1978, he convinced a leukemia patient named Geraldine to leave the hospital, promising her that he could cure her with grape juice. That's awful. What happened to her? Well, unfortunately, Geraldine soon died after entering Roke's care. Police couldn't find a reason to bring him in for her death, but they kept watch over Roke and his healthy living clinic. Roke showed his growing ability to use mystical manipulation by reinterpreting Geraldine's death in a way that allegedly demonstrated his spiritual power. He claimed to his followers that he kissed Geraldine temporarily back to life before giving her to God. But although Roke was able to manipulate his followers, he was no longer able to manipulate his fellow Seventh-day Adventists. In the spring of 1978, Pastor Zita and the other Seventh-day Adventists kicked Roke out of the church. Roke was coming under too much scrutiny from the police, from the suspicious town people of St. Marie, and from the worried relatives of his followers. If Roke wanted to maintain his control over his followers and stay under the radar, he was going to need to isolate them even further. In the early morning of June 5, 1978, Roke piled over a dozen followers into a truck, a bus, and a car, and the caravan left St. Marie forever. Police looked for the followers after their parents filed missing persons reports, 
but all they found was an abandoned bag containing all the followers' ID cards. Yet another dangerous sign of how thoroughly Roke wanted to isolate his followers. They were going somewhere so remote that they wouldn't even need government identification. Exactly. But although Roke had convinced his followers to abandon their lives, he hadn't yet provided them with a clear vision of the future of their group. Now that he no longer needed to pretend to be a Seventh-day Adventist, he was free to make up his own religion. On July 6, 1978, Roke announced to his followers that Doomsday was going to arrive in a few short months, on February 17, 1979. Roke was building upon what he had preached as a Seventh-day Adventist, that Doomsday was imminent. But he created his own version of Doomsday. Roke claimed that the great storms would destroy the earth. Only Roke and his followers would be safe. Because God had chosen Roke as his personal prophet, Roke and his followers needed to create peaceful lives in the wilderness. And after Doomsday arrived in February, they would begin rebuilding society. Of course, all this really meant was Roke had come up with the perfect form of milieu control. In the wilderness, Roke's followers would have almost no contact with anyone outside the cult. He'd be able to isolate and control them completely. On July 9th, Roke and his followers began looking for the ideal place to set up camp and wait out Doomsday. They found a clearing about 13 and a half miles from the town of St. Jacques. Roke dubbed their new home Eternal Mountain. By making it seem holy, Roke was again utilizing mystical manipulation. Roke made his followers cut down trees, dig a well, and build a log cabin from scratch. Roke, of course, didn't participate in the work. Everyone but Roke was constantly exhausted. Working his followers to the bone and not letting them get enough sleep was a key way for Roke to control them. By keeping them perpetually exhausted, he sapped their willpower and ability to make their own decisions. Isn't willpower a personality trait? You're either born a stubborn person with a lot of willpower, or you're born a weak-willed person who can't resist temptation. Well, that's a popular misconception. Willpower is actually a complicated process that involves both the mind and the body. Instead of the fight-or-flight response caused by stress and adrenaline, using willpower invokes a process known as stop and plan. While stress tenses up your body, exercising willpower calms it down and sends energy to the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that controls decision-making. So stress and willpower are sort of biological opposites of each other. Exactly, which is why being stressed out prevents you from being able to utilize your willpower. And sleep deprivation is a form of severe stress on the body. I mean, I know I can get a bit cranky if I don't get enough sleep, but is it really that bad for me to lose a little sleep? It really is. A 2009 study on mice showed that disrupting their circadian rhythms slowed their metabolism and made them hungrier, so they ate more and gained more weight. So no wonder I get hungry late at night. Well, losing sleep does more than make you hungry. The sleep-deprived mice became more impulsive and experienced actual biological changes to their prefrontal cortex. The lack of sleep left them unable to properly exercise their self-control or willpower. So when Roke didn't let his followers get enough sleep, he kept them from using their willpower. That's right. And this wasn't the only technique that Roke used to deplete his followers' willpower. He also starved them. Food affects willpower too? It does. A landmark study called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment that took place over the course of a year from 1944 to 1945 showed the sort of psychological damage caused by starvation. Well, I imagine it was more severe than just feeling hungry all the time. It was. The hungry participants in the study showed signs of depression, anxiety, social isolation, and, most importantly, a reduced ability to think clearly and make decisions. So no wonder the hungrier I am, the harder it is for me to avoid my favorite junk food. Exactly. A 2007 study conducted by a psychologist named Dr. Baumeister showed just how directly food and blood sugar levels are linked. He discovered that forcing study participants to exercise their willpower caused their blood glucose levels to drop, but giving them a sugary drink replenished willpower. In other words, people need the energy from food to feed their brain and feed their willpower. Okay, I get why a lack of willpower would ruin my diet, but why would it prevent Roke's followers from thinking for themselves? Well, think of it like this. From the moment we get up, 
every decision we make, what to wear, what to eat for breakfast, what to prioritize as we get to work, requires us to utilize willpower. And the more decisions we make in a day, the more we deplete our willpower. And the more we deplete our willpower, the harder it is to make decisions. So if Rook's followers already had their willpower depleted through starvation and lack of sleep... It would be incredibly hard for them to make decisions. And after Roke had used starvation and sleep deprivation to deprive his followers of the ability to think for themselves, Roke began to exercise absolute control over them. In September of 1978, he gave them all new names from the Bible. For example, Giselle was now called Esther. Solange was now called Rachel. Gabrielle was now Thurza. And Roke himself was now known as Moses. Renaming his followers was just another way for Roke to further his control over their identities. And by renaming himself Moses after the prophet, Roke was once again using mystical manipulation to make his followers think that Roke, too, was a prophet of God. And that was just the beginning of Roke's manipulations. He made his followers confess their secrets and reminded them constantly that their families and society was evil. He renamed society the world of the dead. These are all techniques commonly used by cult leaders, creating an us versus them mentality, using confessions to exploit followers' vulnerabilities, and again, trying to keep them as isolated as possible from the rest of the world. And as Roke's control over his followers grew more complete, he realized that he no longer needed to stay faithful to Giselle. He decided to sleep with his other female followers. And he was manipulative enough to make Giselle think it was all her fault. When Giselle told Roke that the other girls were lonely, he used this as an excuse to begin sleeping with and eventually marrying and impregnating all of the women except for Jacques' wife, Maurice. As justification, he cited biblical examples like King David. Since Giselle was Roke's legal wife, she became the head wife and continued her role of mothering the other women. Roke also abandoned the healthy lifestyle he had taken up with the Seventh-day Adventists. He made his followers trudge into St. Jog, the local town, to buy him junk food and alcohol. He began beating his followers who angered him with a wooden club. Roke also began to formulate one of the most disgusting principles of his cult. Roke's three young biological children in the cult would be considered the Chosen. But any children in the cult who were not his, like Jacques or Maurice's daughter and new infant son Samuel, were treated like slaves or animals. On December 11th, the parents of Roque's followers convinced police to pick up Roque and take him to Quebec City for a psychological evaluation. A psychiatrist who evaluated Roque believed that Roque might suffer from schizophrenia. Yet shockingly, Roque managed to convince the Quebec psychiatrist that he was harmless. This was the first of many psychiatrists who would be fooled by Roke's intelligent, affable demeanor. In reality, Roke was already brutalizing his followers. In the fall of 1978, he broke two of Maurice's ribs because the starving, pregnant mother didn't ask for his authorization before consuming two pancakes. When Maurice considered leaving the cult, Roke bullied Maurice's husband Jacques into cutting off one of her toes. Remember, poor Maurice was one of the only female cult members who wasn't sleeping with Roque. She had followed her husband Jacques into the cult, but she was trapped in a cycle of abuse. Because she loved her husband, she couldn't bring herself to leave. February 17, 1979, the day Roque's prophesied apocalypse came and went. There was no doomsday. Roque claimed that God's understanding of time was so different from humanity's that naturally there had been a mix-up. And for some reason, his followers all accepted his explanation. At this point, Roke had broken down their willpower and decision-making abilities so effectively that his followers would believe just about anything he said. Even when one of Roke's followers, Jacques Fizet, fled the group briefly in April of 1979, he refused to say anything bad about Roke to reporters. Chantal's parents, however, weren't convinced by Jacques' glowing review of life in the cult. They had learned of the cult's location and of Roque's February 17th doomsday prophecy through fleeting contact with Chantal. And they assumed their daughter would see sense once Roque's doomsday prediction was proven wrong. When she didn't come home after February 17th, they made another desperate attempt to save their daughter. In April of 1979, just a few days after Jacques Fizet's newspaper interview, 
police took both Chantal and Roke away for psychiatric evaluations. Shockingly, psychiatrists claimed that Chantal was mentally healthy, and Roke was once again able to trick psychiatrists into giving him a clean bill of health. But in reality, of course, Roke was still abusing and torturing his followers. And the cult member he liked to torture the most was Maurice's and Jacques' infant son, Samuel. At Roke's direction, Jacques would punish his baby for crying by rolling the naked infant in the snow. That's horrific. It gets worse. In 1981, Roque's sons with ex-wife Francine, 12-year-old Roque Jr. and 10-year-old Francois, convinced Francine to let them join their father in the wilderness. On March 23, 1981, Roque had his followers throw a celebration to welcome his eldest children. Roque's newest follower, a mentally ill young man named Guy Veer, couldn't stand two-year-old Samuel's crying. He punched the child in the face. Instead of getting the toddler to a hospital, Roke decided this gave him the perfect excuse to play doctor. He attempted to circumcise the toddler with a razor blade. As anesthetic, he forced the two-year-old to drink several ounces of pure ethanol. Samuel died that night. Maurice's willpower was so depleted from starvation and lack of sleep that when she heard her son had died, she couldn't even react. She just kept doing her chores. None of Roke's followers were willing to blame him for Samuel's death, but Roke decided he was certainly willing to blame someone else. A few months later, on September 14th, Roke put Guy Veer on trial, blaming him for Samuel's death. Even though everyone else in the cult thought Veer was blameless due to his mental illness, Roke convinced his followers that Veer needed to be castrated. Roke made Veer lie down on a kitchen table. He cut Veer's testicles off with a razor blade and put them in a Kleenex. Poor Veer believed Roke's lie that the castration would help with his headaches. But this punishment wasn't enough for Roke. He began performing mock executions of Veer as well. Finally, on November 5th, Veer escaped and alerted authorities to Samuel's death. Although he was too brainwashed to explain Roke's true role in the toddler's death, Veer gave police enough information for them to arrest the cult leader. On December 19th of 1981, Roke was found criminally responsible for Samuel's death. And at the conclusion of the trial on September 29th, 1982, Roke was sentenced to two years in prison. But even the two years of separation from their cult leader wasn't enough time to break Roke's hold on his followers. They left the wilderness and moved south to a house in New Carlisle to be near the prison. It couldn't have helped that many of the women were now tied to Roke through children. Several of the women gave birth to Roke's children while he was in prison. Solange almost returned home to her family on several occasions while Roke was in prison. But Roke ultimately manipulated Solange into staying with the cult. Sweetening the deal for Solange, Giselle offered to let her be Roke's primary wife. And so Solange stayed with the cult. A decision that would ultimately cost the young woman her life. Let's relax for a moment and talk about something we love. Recently, we checked out Quip, the new company refreshing the way people brush their teeth. Quip is an electric toothbrush that packs premium vibration and timer features into an ultra-slim design. And at just $25, it's half the cost of bulkier brushes. It's as if Apple designed a toothbrush, but without the big price tag. You have to brush with it for yourself. And don't just listen to us. Quip is backed by leading dentists and was named as one of Time Magazine's Best Inventions of 2016. They won a 2016 GQ Grooming Award and made it on Oprah's 2017 New Year's O-List. With Quip, you can subscribe to receive new brush heads on a dentist-recommended three-month plan for just $5, including free shipping. Right now, go to getquip.com slash cults to get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash cults. G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash cults. Now let's get back to the story.
Roque Terrio got out of prison in February 1984, and it didn't take Roque long to convince Giselle and the rest of his flock to abandon their comfortable city life and return with him to the wilderness. On April 13, 1984, Roque bought a landlocked wooded property in Kinmount, a town in Victoria County. Moving to English-speaking Victoria County would completely isolate Roque's French-speaking followers. Only Roque would be able to fluently communicate with outsiders. On May 2, 1984, Roque led his followers back into the wilderness. Once again, Roque sat back and relaxed as his followers built new structures for the cult to live in. As the women gave birth to even more of Roque's children, lack of food once again became a major problem. Initially, Roque made his followers shoplift from the stores in Kinmount, but on January 31, 1985, they were caught shoplifting. So, Roque came up with the idea of setting up roadside farm standings, where his followers sold fresh produce. When that proved successful, Roque convinced wholesalers to give him bakery equipment that he never paid for. Roque then started a bakery company, which he christened The Ant Hill Kids. So that's where the cult gets its name. But why Ant Hill Kids? Roque liked to compare their group to a colony of ants, functioning almost as one organism. Roque thought he had completely isolated his followers this time. Now no one could interfere with his cult. But Roque couldn't maintain his self-control. Roque began drinking again to treat his stomach pain. And he began coming up with even more gruesome methods of torturing his followers. Roque forced them to participate in group orgies, peed in their mouths, whipped them, and beat them with a hammer or the blunt side of an axe. He even circumcised Jacques by ordering the group to slice off the tip of his penis. Roque's followers were too afraid of him to leave. They truly believed that Roque was a prophet of God and that God might strike them down if they abandoned Roque. Social workers were also beginning to worry that Roque was mistreating his children. Their suspicions only grew when on January 26, 1985, Gabrielle left her infant son out in the cold overnight. The baby froze to death. Despite the obvious mistreatment of the baby, the coroner listed the cause of death as SIDS. Yet one more occasion when authorities missed a chance to intervene. Mm -hmm. But the social workers were determined to save the children living in Roque's cult. They soon consulted with a nonprofit called Council on Mind Abuse and realized that Roque was running a cult. As the social workers began watching Roque's cult closely, Roque grew more unstable. In March of 1985, a social worker tried to visit the cult's children, and Roque blew up at her. In June of 1985, Roque got drunk and told his cult that Doomsday had arrived and began using his radio to make phony distress calls to passing aircraft. The more social workers visited the cult, the more disturbed they grew by the behavior of the cult's children. They were quiet and listless. It was obvious they were being abused. Unfortunately, the social workers had no actual proof of Roque's abuse. At least not until Maurice finally abandoned the cult in October of 1985, taking her young children, Jaziel and Thomas, with her. Social workers interviewed Maurice and learned that Roque abused the children both sexually and physically, throwing them into trees whenever he was angry. It was the proof of abuse that authorities needed. On December 6, 1985, social workers raided the commune and took away the cult's 13 children. It was only after the children were placed with foster families that the extent of Roque's abuse became clear. And as a warning for our listeners, the following contains graphic descriptions of child abuse. Roque was the only one allowed to comfort the children or show them kindness. And when Roque wasn't comforting the kids, he was beating them or crushing their fingers to stop them from crying. Roque had the children not only watch the group's orgies, he made the children participate. This rampant sexual abuse had an incredibly detrimental effect on the children's psychology. At Roque's encouragement, the children sexually abused animals and each other. Now, you would think this horrific abuse would be enough to put Roque away. Well, shockingly, not only did Roque stay free, he was also able to manipulate the court-appointed bilingual psychologist into siding with him. The psychologist actually expressed admiration for Roque's lifestyle and insisted none of the children were abused. She claimed Roque was a victim of a prejudiced society and advised the court to give the children back to Roque. 
How is that even possible? It's hard to know for sure, but even years later, in 1993, after Roque was arrested for murder, that same psychologist still refused to admit she was wrong and insisted that Roque hadn't abused his kids. Once again, this wasn't the only psychologist Roque was able to fool. He preyed on the cultural tensions between the French Canadians and the English-speaking Canadians to convince another French Canadian psychologist that he was being discriminated against because he was Quebecois. If the court listened to the psychologist's recommendations, the children would be returned to Roque to experience further torment. Thankfully, the judge saw right through Roque. The judge reprimanded the psychologists for their unprofessional behavior, and on October 27, 1987, he ruled that the children should be permanently taken away from the cult. The children, at least, were now safe from Roque. But even though Roque confessed to police in August of 1986 that he had hurt his wives and children, Assistant Crown Attorney Alex Smith decided not to prosecute a case against him. Roke remained a free man. And with the children gone, Roke became even more violently unstable. He burned the skin off several followers with a welding torch. He punched one of his pregnant wives in the stomach, causing a miscarriage. He yanked the teeth out of several followers' mouths. But for some reason, Roke's followers forgave him every time he apologized. In the cycle of violence, there's what's known as a honeymoon phase, where an abuser will act apologetic and promise never to hurt their victim again. Unfortunately, the honeymoon phase is just a trick an abuser uses to convince his victims to stay. By the fall of 1988, Roke's followers were not in good mental or physical health. They were worn down by a lack of sleep and food, as well as the endless cycle of Roke's terrifying abuse. Solange, in particular, had been complaining about stomach pain. Unfortunately for Solange, Roque's perverse desire to torture his followers under the guise of playing doctor would have tragic results. Roque told everyone he was going to operate on Solange's liver. And as a warning for our listeners, this next description will be graphic. Roque gave Solange an unsanitary enema filled with molasses, oil, and water. Roque sliced Solange's stomach open and began ripping out her intestines. None of Roque's followers did anything to stop him. They even helped Roque stick a tube down Solange's throat for no apparent reason. After spending the night in agonizing pain, Solange died the next morning. But even after one of their own had died from the whims of their mad prophet, Roque's followers couldn't bring themselves to leave him. And Roque only became more unhinged after he killed Solange. He married the already deceased Solange on October 22nd in a bizarre ceremony. But then he went further. After charming and befriending a Utah psychiatrist named Jess Grosbeck, Roke became obsessed with the idea that he was going to give birth to Solange. He got the idea by perverting the Genesis chapter of the Bible. Just as God created Eve out of Adam's rib, Roque believed Solange would be reborn out of his own rib. And Roque's disturbing obsession with playing doctor didn't stop after Solange died. He decided to operate on her corpse. Roque ordered his followers to dig up Solange's body. Then he removed several of Solange's organs and bones and used Solange's corpse to commit horrific acts of necrophilia. Even after Roque's followers burned Solange's body to end Roque's desecration of Solange, Roque used a jar of Solange's bones to further enable his ghastly necrophilic desires. And as if this wasn't grotesque enough, Roque made a necklace out of one of Solange's ribs and wore it constantly. Despite all of this, Roque's followers still wouldn't leave him. The year of 1988 passed by with no reaction from police to Solange's disappearance. Roke literally got away with murder. Even after social workers noticed Solange was missing in the spring of 1989, police did not investigate further. It was Roke's terrifying mutilation of Gabrielle in the summer of 1989 that would finally herald police involvement. Over the decade since the medically trained Gabrielle had joined the group, Roke had enjoyed singling her out for torment, and his love of torturing Gabrielle was about to reach its apex. On July 29th of 1989, a drunken Roke announced he wanted to play doctor yet again. 
Roque grabbed Gabrielle and drove a knife through her hand. After hours of torture, Roque finally took a cleaver and chopped off Gabrielle's arm. Gabrielle ran away to a women's shelter, but Jacques found her and convinced her to return home. Unfortunately, Roque wasn't done torturing Gabrielle. On August 11, 1989, Roque played doctor one final time. He made his followers hold Gabrielle down, then tortured her by applying a flame-heated piece of metal to her stump. On August 14th, Gabrielle ran away back to the women's shelter. And on August 16th, Gabrielle finally went to a hospital. Police questioned Gabrielle about her injury, but Gabrielle still couldn't bring herself to admit Roque's true nature to police. She made up a story claiming that Roque had cut her arm off after she'd been pinned down in a car accident. But even that story gave police enough to go after Roque. On August 19th, they searched the compound. But everyone was gone. For Roque's followers, Gabrielle's dismemberment was the last straw. Most of them had finally found the courage to leave him. For good. With Roque now on the run from the police, only Jacques, Nicole, and Chantal currently remain by their cult leader's side. Roque and his remaining followers managed to evade police for almost two months while living in a makeshift camouflaged hut right near his compound. He was finally caught on October 6th. That very same day, Giselle confessed the truth about Solange's death, enabling the police to charge him with murder. On December 18th, a judge bound Roque for trial on second-degree murder charges. Even after being charged with murder, Roque was still able to trick psychiatrists into thinking he was a good man. In December of 1991, a psychiatrist wrote that Roque was, quote, a very bright, inquisitive, and sensitive man with considerable knowledge of medicine. He cited Roque's issues as stemming from being an extraordinary person in an ordinary world. The psychiatrist even recommended that the court set Roque free. Thankfully, the court didn't listen to the psychiatrist's recommendation. On January 18, 1993, Roque was sentenced to 10 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole. After surviving a decade of torture and mutilation, most of Roque's followers, like Gabrielle and Giselle, managed to free themselves from Roque's control. Gabrielle got some much-needed therapy and read books on cults, learning to recognize the dangerous psychological techniques Roque had used to manipulate his victims. She later published a memoir called The Alliance of the Sheep. Roque's eldest sons also published a memoir about the nightmare they lived through. Most of Roque's victims disappeared into anonymity, seeking refuge with friends and family as they struggled to move on with their lives. Many of them have been given monetary assistance by the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board in Ontario, which offers financial help to the victims of violent crimes. But some of Roque's followers never freed themselves from his control. Francine, Chantal, and Nicole rented homes close to Roque's prison so they could be near him. They continued to see him in prison and have his children. They even opened up a bakery together, just like during their days as the Ant Hill Kids. The bakery was successful until its patrons learned that the women running the charming little boulangerie were the wives of a murderer. And while Roque was able to charm psychiatrists and keep several of his followers under his thumb, there was one group of people he wasn't able to sway, his fellow prison inmates. In April of 1993, Roque was transferred to Kingston Penitentiary to protect him from other inmates who might want to kill him. Even among other killers, Roque's appalling crimes put him amongst the lowest of the low. But this wasn't enough to save Roque. On February 23rd, 2011, Roque's cellmate Matthew McDonald stabbed Roque to death with a shiv. At least we know that the poor men, women, and children who escaped the clutches of the sadistic killer are now safe from him forever. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. 
It seems simple, but it really helps our show. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there because a new episode comes out every Monday. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, production assistance by Carrie Murphy, Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by Jeanette Manning and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Looking for your next storytelling podcast fix? Check out my other podcast, Historical Figures. Every Wednesday, my co-host Carter and I dig up what you don't know about the icons you do know. We cover their unique personality, entertaining anecdotes, and little-known facts, showing you the real humanity behind mythologized figures. And it's also a ParCast podcast, so you can find historical figures anywhere you listen to cults.